Dr. Cliff Lamb is actually head of the Department of Animal Science at Texas A&M University in College Station. And he is going to speak to us specifically on using reproductive management to enhance profitability of cattle operations. Uh, prior to his position at Texas A&M, Dr. Lamb came to us from the North Florida Research and Education Center at the University of Florida in Mariana, Florida. Beautiful part of the state, by the way. He received his BS in Animal Science from Middle Tennessee State and completed his MS and PhDs from Kansas State. His primary research efforts have focused on applied reproductive physiology in cattle, emphasizing synchronization and placement, heifers, and postpartum cows. And I will have to share a personal story about Dr. Lamb. Um, at Santa Rosa Ranch, you can imagine as a seed stock producer, we use, utilize a lot of reproductive technology. So we do a lot of IVF, ET, AI work in our operation. And so the first time that Dr. Lamb came over to visit with us. He was asking about the protocol we used to sync our recips, and we're just kind of riding along and we're telling him about our protocol that we use, and he just kind of sits there, and once you get to know Dr. Lamb, he is ridiculously humble, and he just goes, yeah, I developed that. So, personal experience tells you Dr. Lamb is quite the expert on what we're about to hear this afternoon. So, hope you all enjoy what, he, what he's going to be deal uh, discussing with us this afternoon, and please welcome Dr. Cliff Lamb. Thanks, Kelly. Appreciate it. Well, howdy. You know, it's, it's, it's good to be here. I was here last year and got an opportunity to see what a great program this was, and certainly appreciate Andy and the team that put this on. Um, uh, you know, I, th I think that this uh, really gives uh, Texas A&M a, a a great face. For, for those of you up here, and we're certainly dedicated uh, to making sure that those folks that are in this part of the state are not neglected as far as Texas A&M is, a is concerned. And so I certainly appreciate uh, what everybody does here in terms of, um, uh, in terms of uh, spreading the message and, and making sure that we do a great job of educating everybody in, the, the, in this part of the state, just like we do in the, in the other parts of the state. And so, Again, I mean, uh, as Kelly mentioned, I'm, I am the department head of animal science down there, and awfully proud to be the department head. Um, from, from a programmatic standpoint, we're the largest animal science department in the world. We have about 1,300 undergraduate students and about 150 graduate students and uh, about 64 faculty members. Of those 64 faculty members, 50 of them, and you may not even recognize ma many of the names, uh, some of them are here today, but certainly 50 of them do something in terms of beef cattle work whether it's in really, um, uh, they're working on the science, the basic knowledge, or they're uh, educating people out in the state, or they're teaching our students. And so we're awfully proud of the impact that we have, not only in Texas, but around the world, in terms of educating folks uh, on beef cattle production. And so I'm awfully proud to be able to be a part of that, that team. So, you know, uh, you probably already noticed I uh, sort of speak a little bit funny. Um, I grew up in, in Africa. Uh, this small country called Zimbabwe, many of you might have uh, called it, uh, remember it being called Rhodesia. I grew up on a really, uh, fairly large beef cattle operation. We ran about 1,500 beef cows and we uh, milked, a, a, we had a fairly large dairy. And I've always been um, a part of, the, those, are, those are pictures of me. Um, I, I was really, really lucky when I was fairly young. My dad really gave me a lot of opportunities to do, do a lot of things that most kids don't get to do. Uh, when I was about 12 years old, I learned to artificially inseminate cows. And so that was always a passion of mine. I mean, and you can imagine, I mean, being in Africa, you wouldn't anticipate. I mean, most people picture us trying to run away from lions and elephants in loincloths, right? But that's not me. I mean, we were really advanced, and I learned to um, uh, uh, apply a lot of these reproductive technologies fairly young. From 12 until now, I mean, that was always my goal. I was really fortunate at a very young age to know that I wanted to specialize in reproduction. And that's all I ever did. And so a lot of kids today don't have that opportunity. And, and so my passion is trying to make sure that we get kids to, 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 to live for their passions. And so, but the industry has been very good to me. The beef industry, it doesn't matter where in the world I, I have been, I've spent most of my life in the US and uh, the beef industry has been really good to me. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about utilizing reproductive technologies to make an impact on your operations from a financial standpoint or a productivity standpoint. 
And when you take a look, I, mean, I know Dave Lawman talked earlier, you know, a lot of people, um, a, a lot of the talks that you've heard today and going to continue hearing throughout, they're going to be intertwined in many ways. And my goal is to make sure that uh, out of my presentation, that you can just take one thing home and go, you know, I learned something from that talk. And if, if that's the case, then, then I've done my job here today. So when you take a look at a lot of the most productive cattle operations and, uh, uh, around the country, and, and we've, we've taken a look at all the SPA data and all of the other farm, farm business management data, those operations that have a greater percentage of their cows calving early in the calving season are the most productive cattle operations in, the, in this country. And so I've spent the last 25 to 30 years of my life working on ways to get more cattle to calve in the, at the beginning of the calving season. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today is how can we get more cattle to calve at the uh, beginning of the calving season. One of those methods I think Kelly talked about is developing synchronization uh, systems. But that's not my goal isn't to make sure everybody AIs. I mean, I, I don't want everybody to leave here after my talk saying, you need to go and artificially inseminate your cattle. My goal is to say, use some of the concepts that I talk about and see if you could implement one or two of those things in your operation, and it might have an impact in your operation. So the first thing, though, that I, I, I realized this, and, you know, like I said, I come from Africa, but the thing that I've realized, I've lived in this country now for 30 years, is our competition isn't our neighbors. It's not a, a, all of us sitting in, in this, in this um, part of the world. We, we heard earlier from Troy Uplands about uh, beef production being a global industry. What is happening now, though, is our global competitors are not the people we typically think about. I know we talk about South America and Australia as global competitors, but I'm going to share with you some, some other parts of the world that are adopting technologies at a lot faster rate than we adopt technologies in this country. You take a look at this bull down here on the bottom left. That there is a boron bull in Kenya. That bull is a cloned bull, okay? And Kenya is not typically a beef producing part of the world, right? But these guys are cloning bulls that are um, resistant to certain tick-borne diseases. And these bulls are mating cows now to create calves that are uh, resistant to ticks. How many of us are utilizing cloning technologies in this country to be able to do this? Here in this, in this uh, picture here, these are some sheep in Ethiopia. I forget the name of the sheep. They've got a funny name. But what they are is the, these animals are resistant to external parasites. And so what they're doing now is they're utilizing these genetics to breed to dorper uh, sheep in Ethiopia to create dorpers that are resistant to, to ticks. So to get away from these um, uh, uh, parasiticides that we utilize in sheep. And so what you're starting to see from a global standpoint is adoption of technologies and adoption of things to make cattle production systems or livestock production systems in areas of the world that we typically wouldn't think. The other thing that was talked about earlier by Troy is, um, is some of these other protein products. And here you can see, this is a picture that was given to me by Richard Miles at the University of Florida about uh, 12 years ago. And he, here you can see pictures of chickens that were basically produced in 1957, and they were slaughtered at day 43 to day 85. You take a look down here at the bottom, bottom bar, that's chickens today. They look very, very different today than what they did before. Well, if you speak to the average consumer who doesn't have a clue what we do, what would they blame this on? They'll say that these are hormones or antibiotics, right? But they're very uneducated because we've never legally been allowed to use hormones in chickens in this country. And so what is uh, the reason for this tremendous increase is basically two things. Tremendous improvement in genetics in chickens and in management techniques. That is what has resulted in these chickens becoming uh, so different from what they were about 60 years ago. And so, so it's the adoption of technologies that is making us more and more competitive. If you take a look at this slide here, this rep represents changes in dairy cow numbers and changes in milk production since 1944. In 1944, the number of dairy cows in this country was around 26 million dairy cows. Today, we only have about 10 million dairy cows that, uh, that we're milking uh, or lactating right now. At the same time, during that same period of time, we've had a 375% increase in milk production from those, those dairy cows. That's quite telling. We've become a lot more efficient in our dairy production in this country. 
and the introduction of reproductive technologies occurred in the late 1940s and early 1950s. And it probably, it allowed us to speed up our opportunities to increase genetic improvement in dairy cattle. And you can see a tremendous improvement there. So from a beef standpoint, there, there are several technologies that, that are very underutilized. But the one thing that I mentioned early on is uh, what is the most important benchmark that we can utilize in, um, in, in a beef cattle operation? And so generally what I tell people to do is, uh, most people will say, oh, they want to get their cows pregnant, they want uh, pregnancy rates and things like that are really important. But what I will say is the most economically important thing to a beef cow calf producer is the percentage of cows he has calving early in the calving season. And altering that percentage of ca uh, the calving over time probably will have the biggest, biggest economical impact over almost anything else that you do. And so focusing on the, the percentage of cows calving um, is extremely important. And you don't need a lot of technology to measure this every year. You just pick a time, and I usually pick 30 days. But you pick 30 days and say, this year I had 60% of my cows calve in the first 30 days. Next year, if you have more uh, than that, then you're doing a good job. If you have less, then you might be doing something that you need to change. But to change the percentage of cows calving, that's a reproductive benchmark that you can utilize in your operation that does not take a lot, lot of work. But before I get to talking about how we can change this, I also want to share with you how to think about pregnancy in cattle. And I want people to think very differently from what they th have thought in the past. And so the reason is that when you go and you do a pregnancy diagnosis on your operation, that pregnancy diagnosis, let's say you artificially inseminate your cows or you breed your cows and, and the vet comes and does a pregnancy diagnosis. And he pregnancy tests your cattle and he says you've got 70% of your cattle are pregnant. That does not mean that 70% of your cattle became pregnant to start with. That is how many animals are pregnant at that time. They might come and say 95% of your cows are pregnant. Well, that might be the breeding season pregnancy rate. And so those cows might have had three or four chances to become pregnant to get to 94 or 95%. What I think we've got to think about, a little bit differently about, about pregnancy checking and pregnancies in your animals, is the, percent, the number of cows that are pregnant or those cows that are going to calve, those are the cows whose pregnancies survived. Because if you take a look at this, this graph, and this shows... Basically, when a cow comes into estrus, when she comes into heat, she shows heat, and then about a day later, or, and she's mated by a bull, or you artificially inseminate her, it doesn't really matter. But around that period of time, within a day of when that cow comes into heat, 95 to 100% of the times that a cow is mated, whether it's by artificial insemination or by natural service, you end up with a pregnancy. Almost every single time we end up with a pregnancy. But what happens then over the next week or so, we lose about 20% of those pregnancies. And those pregnancies are lost for very good reason, okay? The embryo, there might be genetic in incompatibilities where uh, the embryo might end up with two heads or five legs or something like that. We don't want that embryo to, uh, to survive, right? We want that embryo to d die. So there's a lot of embryo death at that period of time. But what, what we wanted to do is we want those embryos to die so that the cow can come back into heat and she can get, get bred again. And so we'll start losing pregnancies again. And then around, eight, uh, around two weeks after the, the cow became pregnant, what happens is that embryo must tell the cow she is pregnant. If the embryo does not tell the cow she is pregnant, the cow comes back into heat. So the embryo has got a signal to the cow as, uh, to, otherwise, she comes back into heat about three or four days after that period of time. So around day 20, 21, she'll come back into heat if the embryo didn't tell her she was pregnant. And then around day 42, 43, somewhere around there, the embryo becomes a fetus, and it rarely survives well beyond that point. From that point, around day uh, 42 to 60 of pregnancy, if you do a pregnancy diagnosis from that point all the way until birth, you'll only have about 2 to 5% of your uh, fetuses will die from, from that point on. So, but, so that's how we end up with about a 65% pregnancy rate every time a set of cows is mated to one mating. Okay, So if you have 100 cows in a herd and they, you know that they can all become pregnant, they all have the potential to become pregnant, and you put bulls in there that are all capable of breeding those cows, 
and you put them in with those cows for 21 days, and the cows come in to eat, and the bulls mate them, and then you take, uh, you take the bulls out, and then you come back and do a pregnancy diagnosis, you'll get about 65% of your cows pregnant. That's about, that's about average, okay? That's about where it is. You might end up with 70, 75%, but you might end up with 50, uh, 55% too. 65% is about average, and it's very, very good, okay? 65% is very good. It might not sound great, but uh, for a single, off, uh, off, a single offspring bearing species like cattle, um, it is one of the highest that we have in terms of embryo survival, about 65%. Humans are the worst. We, uh, they're somewhere around 30 to 35% survival rates, and uh, cattle are around 60. We, we, we have almost double. The problem is, in cattle, we've selected for fertility over a period of time. Generally, we do that. <laughs> Humans, we let everybody breed, right? So we don't really care. So our fertility is really poor in the human race. This happens, this happens in a lot of other species, but we don't notice it. So for example, in pigs, the, the rates are a lot higher than cattle. Uh, the embryo uh, death rates are a lot higher than in cattle. But in pigs, what happens is you might have a sow that uh, ends up becoming pregnant with 25 piglets. She gives birth to 12 piglets. You didn't know that she lost 13 piglets, right? She still gave birth to 12 piglets. In cattle, the problem is that we have is we rely heavily on that animal giving birth to one animal every time. Mm -hmm. The other point I want to make is uh, with regards to artificial insemination and um, natural service. I talked about those 100 cows that natural service would get 65%. If you did the same thing, but you didn't put balls in, you heat detected those cows, and you came back and you artificially inseminated every cow that came into heat, the pregnancy rates would be 65% also. If you used a semen from a reputable company with somebody who knew what they were doing, the pregnancy rates are identical to what natural service does. We get very similar pregnancy rates. The difference between those two, though, out in practice is, invariably, we're never comparing apples to apples. When we use artificial insemination, we're not usually heat detecting like a bull does all the time. With artificial insemination, we're usually including artificial insemination with some type of other reproductive technology that stimulates cows to become pregnant that may never have had a chance to become pregnant, which the bull may never have mated. That results generally in somewhat lower pregnancy rates with artificial insemination because we're using a lot of other tools. But we change uh, the, the, the way that we manage cows. So, When you use a cleanup bull behind AI, it works fine. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yep, same percentages. Yep. So what are some of the things that affect embryo mortality or embryo survival? Uh, genetic, genetic factors. I talked uh, very uh, quickly about genetic factors. Heat stress. And when I talk about heat stress, it's not uh, one day we had some hot weather or three or four days we had hot weather. It's sustained heat stress in such a way that a cow cannot cool down over, over a nighttime period of time. And so heat stress is something that, that causes uh, uh, embryo mortality. The asynchrony between the embryo and the maternal environment, that embryo being able to tell the cow she is pregnant is extremely important, and making sure the cow doesn't come back into heat. This is what an embryo looks like. This is the placenta, and that little dark spot there would be the embryo. The more that placenta grows into that uh, uterus, the longer that is, the greater ability that animal has to, um, um, uh, to signal to the cow that she is pregnant. Now, the one thing that's extremely important and that has a positive impact on how fast that embryo grows is the condition at which those cows calve. And that's why we generally say when we're talking about, auto, uh, when we're talking about breeding cattle, probably the biggest impact that you can have on your operation from a fertility standpoint is make sure the cows calve at a decent condition because that has the greatest impact on embryo, uh, on, on embryo growth when you get those cows pregnant. Okay, some other factors there, obviously, the effect of the sire and different types of matings that you can use with the sire, nutrition and temperament and handling stress. Those are all things that have a negative impact on embryo survival and things that we, we can manage from our, from our operations. So what I'm going to very quickly talk to you about is when I was at the U University of Florida before moving to Texas is, is we had an opportunity to go into a herd and monitor this herd over a period of time. 
And like I said, I, I wanted to try and put everything that we knew about reproduction and use reproduction as a way of improving profitability in an operation over a period of time, just putting together things that we knew actually had positive impacts. This herd was about a 300 head cow-calf operation. Uh, about a half of the cows were Angus, Sim Angus based cows, and half of the cows were Brangus or Brayford based cows. And so um, you could probably have all of those types of cattle in, in this type of environment, and I would say probably more to the Angus, uh, Sim Angus based cows. These animals had not really been pushed very hard from a reproductive management standpoint. And so we went into that operation and we said we were going to try and implement multiple things to see if we could bunch up the percentage of cows calving early in the calving season. And the one thing that we, the mantra we used is that pregnancy has a four times greater economic impact than any other production trait we can select for. So it doesn't really matter what other production traits you think of. I mean, if you read Drover's Journal or Beef Magazine, they keep on talking about the latest and greatest technology, but if a cow doesn't become pregnant and doesn't calve, it doesn't really matter how great her yearling and weaning weights are, right? Okay, get the cow pregnant first. And so our mantra was pregnant is going to be the prettiest thing on the, her on the herd, and then we're going to use all these other tools later on, but we're going to get cattle pregnant first and focus on pregnancy first. And so we basically said we were trying to build a better, more productive cow. And so many of you guys know who this is. This is Macaulay Culkin, that uh, um, child actor from 25 or 30 years ago. But I, I use this example quite a bit because I think we do a very horrible job of being able to select heifers uh, that ultimately become great cows just by looking at them phenotypically. But we still, do a, uh, we still select our heifers phenotypically very often before we actually get those animals pregnant. And so this is what we try to do is to get away from this a little bit to make sure we get the cattle pregnant first before we start worrying about any of those other things. And so he was going to be a star, right? This is what he looks like now. <laughs> I think a lot of our heifers are that way too. They end up looking like that, but they're beautiful as heifers, right? <laughs> okay. This is what happens. We select heifers because they're pretty first before we start worrying about how they're going to become cows. So what we did is we said, we're going to set some rules for our cows. And uh, for every animal in this operation, and again, you, you can come up with your own rules, but uh, we said we're going to make rules for every cow. Every cow had to calve by the time she was two years of age. Make sure every cow calves by, the, by, uh, by 24 months, otherwise she's eliminated from the herd. Every cow has to calf once a year, every year. These are not unreasonable, right? But w we stuck to these. Every cow had to calve without assistance, okay? We don't want to have to go there and help cows calve, but if we do, we're going to mark those animals down, they're going to wean a calf, and that cow is not going to stay on the herd to calve again. We're going to eliminate those cows from the operation. There are enough technologies out there right now to really reduce dystocia. We don't need, to, uh, we don't need cows uh, to, to calve uh, with assistance, okay? But the reason is, Remember, we're focusing on pregnancy first in this operation. So the cows, uh, cows that require assistance, whether it's a mild pull to a C-section, are going to have about 10% lower pregnancy rates than those animals that calve without assistance. So again, because pregnancy is important to us, we eliminate those animals from the herd. We had uh, some production-related um, rules. The cow must provide sufficient resources for the calf to reach its genetic potential. In other words, a cow has to raise a calf. She has to provide the resources, whether it's milk, whatever it is, sufficient resources in our conditions to raise that calf. Okay? The corollary to that is that every calf had to be genetically capable of performing. And the cow provides ha at least half the genetics, right? And so if the calf is a bit of a dink, we're going to get rid of the cow because she's partially responsible for the calf uh, being the way it is. Okay, so again, we, we record all of that information. And then cows had to maintain their body condition score for our conditions. Okay, that doesn't mean to say we don't mind thin cows. What we don't want to do is we don't want to separate thin cows from uh, well-conditioned cows and feed them separately. Okay, we know cows fluctuate in body condition score. And Dave Lawman touched on this. He did a great job earlier talking about this. Cows fluctuate in condition two to 300 pounds a year, depending on the time of the year. 
All we don't want to do is we don't want to separate thin cows from uh, well-conditioned cows. Those, those thin cows that don't seem to be able to handle our conditions, we wanted to eliminate. And so those are some of the things that we, uh, we uh, those are some of the rules. The last, uh, the last one here then is the cows cannot be crazy. They cannot have a disposition problem, right? <laughs> I tell, I, I tell my wife this, that she would have been cold, but she doesn't like that. <laughs> but I, so I never do it in public, though. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, thanks, Andy. You're a friend. <laughs> but the, the reason for getting rid of uh, uh, disposition problems isn't because of that crazy animal. That crazy animal's comfortable being crazy, right? Okay, but what happens with a crazy animal when you go into a pasture and she runs across the pasture? The rest of the herd follows them. They're not as comfortable being crazy, and those are the ones we're trying to protect by getting rid of temperamental cattle. And so that's why we call uh, crazy cattle. The one rule that I didn't put on here that I regret never putting on the set of rules is you cannot give a cow a name, because once you give a cow a name, you'll never get rid of her. Okay, and so. We, we, set, we live by these rules for seven years, and I'm going to share with you what happened to this operation over a period of six years from a production and an economic standpoint in this herd. The other thing that we did, so we got a set of rules that we put uh, together for these cows. We, then we also had multiple reproductive management things that we wanted to implement on this herd and follow the herd for a period of time. The first thing we did is we only kept heifers that became pregnant in the first 25 days of the breeding season. Okay, and the reason for that is if you look at this data, and there's just tons of data that show exactly the same thing, but this is data that shows uh, heifers that became pregnant in the first 21 days of the very first breeding season as replacement heifers are the black line versus those that became pregnant after the first 21 days when they were heifers. From a longevity standpoint, those animals that became pregnant at the beginning of the breeding season, when they were heifers, a greater percentage of them stayed in the herd through nine breeding seasons. So that, that's fairly significant. The longevity in the herd was uh, significant just because they became pregnant early in the breeding season. Okay, but the, uh, the other thing that's important is what is the economic advantage of that? And you take a look at this data. These are the calves from those same females and all the way through the seventh calf just because those females became pregnant in the first 21 days when they were heifers, their calves' weaning weights were greater for the next seven years compared to those females that became pregnant after the first 21 days of the breeding season. That's fairly significant, right? And so we decided in our operation, we're going to give our heifers 25 days to become pregnant. So we had to keep 60 heifers a year that were going to be replacement heifers that were going to go through calving. We didn't just pick our 60 to 65 best heifers because of phenotypic or whatever um, uh, traits that they needed. We picked our 90 best heifers. We ran them through a breeding season. Uh, we, we did synchronize and artificially inseminate them. We uh, put them in with cleanup bulls. And then we came back and ultrasound pregnancy diagnosed them. Any female that was pregnant in the first 25 days was eligible to stay. And that's when we utilized selection pressure at that point to get rid of any of the ugly ones, right? The Macaulay Culkins. Okay, that's what we did. We eliminated them at that point. So of the 90 heifers, we generally, because of the way we managed them, would get 70 to 80% pregnant in 25 days. They had two chances to become pregnant for the most part. And so we could call 10 to 20 heifers that were pregnant every year based on whatever other criteria we used. So that's the first thing we did. The other thing we said is, that we're going to synchronize and artificially inseminate every female on the operation. We're going to use synchronization because synchronization will stimulate non-cycling cows to cycle so they have a chance of becoming pregnant sooner. In other words, they'll calve sooner in, the first, in every calving season. So every female is going to be synchronized. And then the artificial insemination was the way to change our genetics over a period of time. So that was something else we did. The last thing we did then is that we decrease the breeding season as much as we could. And so this is my only synchronization slide. I'm not going to talk about synchronization. It's not rocket science. We've developed synchronization systems that know that work. Utilize these systems that you find in the back of the AI catalogs from the semen companies that are here. Don't try and reinvent the wheel. These are systems that work. Just utilize those systems. OK, so this, uh, each of these lines represents a different uh, breeding season 
over the seven breeding seasons. So I'll start at the top, 2006 and 2007. These two breeding seasons were the two breeding seasons before we did put any pressure on that herd for pregnancy. Okay, bulls went into the breeding uh, into the herd, and then 120 day breeding season later, they removed the bulls. Maybe, but that's what happened. And I looked at this and I said, 120 day breeding season. Uh, that seems awfully long to me. Some of you might think it's a third too short, but it looked long to me. And I said, uh, we're going to reduce the breeding season. And so we came in here in the spring of 2008, and we artificially inseminated all the heifers on the first day of the breeding season. A week later, we artificially inseminated as many cows as we could. But based on the breeding season the year before, we still had cows calving here. So we couldn't AI cows that we still hadn't calved. So we had a group of cows we call the late calving cows. We AI'd them later. And then we had the really late, late calving cows. We AI'd them really late into the breeding season. And then we removed the bulls about 10 days earlier that first year. You can imagine how popular I was at this operation uh, for, the, for the employees. Because the year before, they put bulls in. They took bulls out 120 days later. Quite a simple procedure. We had to handle animals at least 12 times during that period of time. Im implementing applied reproductive technologies is a hassle factor. Don't let anybody tell you that it's, it, it doesn't require hassle, right? There are things that uh, you, you, it does take some dedication and some time, and we ran through the same thing there. But we wanted to see what happened to this herd over a period of time. What would, what would happen from this herd from an economic standpoint? 2009, you can notice we did exactly the same thing, but we reduced the breeding season quite a bit that second year. 2010, you start seeing some differences now. We only had two groups of cows to AI. 2011, only two groups to AI, but every year we reduced the breeding season length. Then in 2012 and 2013, Notice what happens. We AI the heifers on the first uh, day of the breeding season. A week later, we AI the cows, okay? And every cow that was eligible to be artificially inseminated was AI'd on the first day of the breeding season. We managed to get to that point from 120-day breeding season down to a 70-day total breeding season in four years. We managed to, uh, to, to uh, scrunch all of that down. And if you take a look very closely, the cow breeding season length was 62 to 64 days. We essentially cut the breeding season length in half in that herd in four years by focusing on pregnancy in that herd. So this is what we use when I, I do a lot of consulting over a lot of operations around the country. And uh, so just focusing on having a look over a period of time, what happens to the operations over time. Um, we use this sort of, um, it's called a survival curve. So on the left-hand side, down at the bottom, is the first day of the, breeding, uh, of the calving season every year, all the way to the last day of the calving season every year. And so let's focus on this sort of uh, green bar on the right here. Every time a cow calves during that calving season, you just keep on adding that cow, uh, those cows until 100% of the cows calve uh, during that, uh, that calving season. The green line and the red line on that graph to the right represent the two years before we put any pressure on that herd for pregnancy and uh, really put pressure on that herd to perform from a uh, fertility standpoint. The more to the right that that line shifts, the less, uh, the more spread out calving is. The more to the left that line shifts, the, the tighter the calving is, the, the greater the percentage of cows that are calving early in the calving season. The, le the yellow line here represents the first year we put pressure on that herd for pregnancy. And every subsequent line to the left, all the way to the blue, was every subsequent year. Okay, and so we gradually shifted everything to the left, and that's what that was the uh, that was the uh, the great thing about this operation is we continued to shift shift everything to the left. We increased the percentage of cows that are calving. What we did from this blue line, 60% of the ca cattle um, on this blue line here were at around 37 days into that calving season. We changed that by 67 days compared to the uh, red line. We managed to do that in four years. We managed to change the average calving date by 67 days just by committing to looking at pregnancy in our operation. The other thing that a lot of people ask me about is pregnancy rates to AI. And you know, somebody who works in developing synchronization systems, who works with reproduction, I don't get hung up on pregnancy rates to AI. 
If I want to get really good pregnancy rates to AI, I will come into your operation and I will pick the cows that are going to do well. Okay, I'm going to pick your mature cows that are in good condition that calved early, right? And we'll get you 65, 70% pregnancy rates. You can go to the coffee shop or the bar and tell everybody what a great job you did. The cows that benefit the greatest from any reproductive technology are going to be your high-risk cows, your young cows, uh, thin cows, um, uh, poor body condition cows. Those are the ones that benefit from the synchronization because it kickstarts them. They're generally not cycling, so it kickstarts them to start to cycle quicker than had you not implemented the synchronization system. And so that's why we try and tell people, don't worry about the AI pregnancy rates. What you're doing is you're having an impact on the reproductive performance and you're being able to shift the, the average calving season. And so that, that, uh, that, that's extremely important. The thing that you have to realize, though, is you cannot have the same expectations for pregnancy rates. If you have poor conditioned cows, you have young cows, you have late calving cows, the pregnancy rates may only be three, uh, uh, 30 or 35 percent, but that's three out of 10 pregnancies you would never have had a chance to get. And so that, that, that's what the synchronization does. So I'm coming close to the end here. What I'm going to share with you here is overall breeding season pregnancy rate. So at the end of the breeding season, in 2006 and 2007, before we put any pressure on that herd for fertility, notice what the pregnancy rates were in the mid to low 80% range. So it was a 120-day breeding season, but they were still only getting 80 uh, to 86% pregnancy rates. Look what happened, okay? We increased pregnancy rates by 10% in that operation, while at the same time cutting the breeding season length in half, okay, because we started focusing on cows that worked in our operation. I'm not telling you we're selecting for pregnancy, okay, selecting for fertility takes a long time. What we're doing is we're picking cows that work in our, in our operation under our conditions that work under our conditions too. And that's what we managed to do is more effectively select the females that are going to work in our system. To me, this is the most important slide here. And this, uh, this slide represents this herd down here on the second to bottom row. Take a look at that uh, dollar figure. That dollar figure represents the increase in calf value at weaning compared to before we put any pressure on that herd at, at, um, um, uh, for, for pregnancy. On the average, just after putting some pressure on that herd for pregnancy, every calf that we weaned was worth $87 more than the year before. Okay, right now, every calf that is produced on that operation is worth $169 at weaning more than where we were six years before. So every so that, that is significant, okay, just because we focus on pregnancy in that operation. To that operation, they're bringing in $57,000 more per year in calf value at weaning than what they were putting, that, than what they were bringing in six years ago. These, these values are all on a constant calf price basis because I didn't want to include the fluctu fluctuation in, in uh, cattle market that Troy was talking about. I wanted to use a constant calf price basis. So this is all based on a constant calf price basis. So this operation is bringing in about $50,000 more per, uh, just in terms of calf value just by putting pressure on that herd for pregnancy. That's quite significant. Now. What I did in this operation is I allowed our staff to spend that money. And you know, the first year, the second year, the third year, there was a lot of complaining about doing all of this work, right? But when they started getting to spend money buying balers, buying, now this half a pickup, it used to be a pickup, okay? When you get to spend money, that changes things. You get a, little, a few more resources. And so the attitude on this operation changes also. What you find is it takes about four to six years to get to a point where everybody seems to know what to do. And so utilizing this sort of uh, recipe, it became part of what we did. You wean calves, you vaccinate calves, you preg check. Okay, in this operation, they synchronized and AI'd. They just did these things, it just became part of the operation. It doesn't happen overnight, it takes patience and it takes a little bit of dedication. But the results were significant to that operation. The uh, two last slides that I'm going to show is some data that I've been collecting through the temperate part of this country. 
all the way from Oklahoma all the way up to North Dakota. And this is data that I have on 39 operations that I've been working with for a long period of time. Half of these operations, uh, so there are 39 op operations, um, 22 of these operations are natural service operations. They don't, don't use synchronization in AI. And um, uh, 17 of the operations uh, use uh, estrus synchronization in artificial insemination. This represents the, average, the typical calving distribution in the 22 herds that don't use synchronization at all, just natural service. But I've worked with these operations for a long period of time. And this represents the calving distribution during the calving seasons. I call all 39 of these operations well-managed herds. They all have very short breeding seasons. They have less than 75-day calving seasons. They're all well-managed herds. Just some use uh, applied reproductive technologies and others do not. So this is usually the expected planned day of calving. And you can see it's sort of, um, we always get calves before we first expect them. So what, uh, what I wanted to show here, though, is within the first 30 days of calving, for these operations that don't use applied reproductive technologies, 44% of these uh, 22 herds, 44% of the calves were born in the first 30 days after the first calf was born about 44%. That's not that bad. We see a lot worse numbers. And so 44% is uh, on these 22 well-managed herds. To me, though, the thing that you get from synchronization, and this isn't to say anything negative about the genetic companies, the thing about synchronization is what it does from a reproductive management standpoint. Most people never think about that as a why we use synchronization, is it stimulates cows to cycle that we're not normally cycling. And so if you think about this, on the average, these cows at the, at the next breeding season, so what they've done is they've calved, but they have to get ready to become pregnant at the start of the next breeding season. And so on the average, these cows are about 64 days postpartum on the first day of the next breeding season. In other words, they have 64 days to overcome calving and start their estrous cycles again so that they can start becoming pregnant at the beginning of the next breeding season. 64 days isn't bad. The problem with these herds is that 43% of these herds are less than 50 days postpartum. So 43% of these cows are at high risk for not cycling at the start of the next breeding season. They likely won't be cycling when you turn the bulls in or you AI the next breeding season that day. And so that's why uh, synchronization can stimulate cows to start to cycle. Take a look at those 17 herds, though, that we utilize reproductive technologies. Um, here you see how everything is front-loaded, and 88% of those cows are born in the first 30, uh, 30 days. When you take a look at the number of days before the next breeding season, 79 days postpartum. They had an extra 15 days to overcome calving so that they could potentially be cycling at the start of the next breeding season, and on the average, only 7% of those cows are at high risk for not being ready to be pregnant at the start of the next breeding season. So synchronization isn't just a way that we utilize uh, technology to put semen into cows. It's a reproductive management tool to potentially change the economics in your operation. And that's one of the advantages uh, of it. So I have a lot of people to thank. Obviously, a lot of the work that we do is done uh, in a collaborative fashion and certainly thank a lot of people. There is my contact information, and uh, Kelly, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Dr. Lamb, thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Lamb? I thought I saw a hand or two pop up during the presentation. Oh, oh, there we go. Mm-hmm. We, we basically used, um, so we use a three-year average, and we just use that average for the rest of the period of time, just, just to create. So the, the question is, how did we come up with a calf value? We just used an average value for the very first year, and we use that same value throughout the rest of the time. So how did you figure out how much you increased the head before the head you popped up? Yep. So, uh, so, so yes. So the question is, how did we figure that out based on, because of the fact that we were tightening up things? So we did not use a slide, if that's what you're asking. But uh, we, what we did is we basically calculated the, um, 
The start of the breeding season was always the same uh, through that whole period of time, and weaning was always exactly the same week. And so we calculated the calf value at weaning for, for the herd every single year. Yeah. Any other questions? Wanted to mention also, Multiman USA has sponsored Dr. Lamb being here. So, of course, we want to thank Heath Landis, Dr. Goodman. Y'all make sure and go by and visit the good folks at Multiman. Um, oh, one other question right there, Dr. Lamb. That's a very good question. I mean, um, so, so if you use natural service, can you use synchronization to start with? And then um, do you just synchronize a portion of the cows versus uh, some other cows that might not need synchronization, right? So one of my things is I think that a lot of cattle producers uh, tend to manage individual animals. I prefer to focus on the herd, right? And so whole herd management, whatever you do, think of it as a herd. And, and rather than managing each individual animal. I think that there are ways if you're going to, if you're going to synchronization in natural service operations is a very underutilized uh, tool. Uh, there are a lot of ways to synchronize that is not very expensive at all and that, that you could utilize. Um, I would synchronize the whole herd, create an opportunity to get more cattle to become pregnant. Even if you have older cows that are cycling that you have no problem getting pregnant, if you can get that cow pregnant, I mean, if, if she's going to come into heat in a 21-day uh, window, and if she's in heat the day before the bull comes into heat, uh, the, the, the day before a, a you start your breeding season, okay, the next time she comes into heat is 21 days l later. If you can synchronize her and get to come into heat two days after the bull goes in, you've got an extra 19 days of potential calf growth when that cow gives birth, right? And so even your, your, high risk, uh, your low risk cows, uh, if you're going to synchronize, that's one thing to, to con consider doing. Do it to the whole herd, and it's not that expensive. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lamb.